for it from sliding down, oops, hold on, sliding down the stairs and I went to catch it and I'm hypermobile to begin with and it <laughs> yanks it. So this has been going on a little while, um, six months, I guess. Mm -hmm. And this morning, so in Pilates, we've been working on strengthening and it's not that I need to release anything else in here. Gina already released it probably a couple times, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, but what it, oops, what it requires is strength. Mm -hmm. So when adding strength to the hypermobility discomfort, I'm like, oh my gosh, like I would, I can, mm -hmm. the pain is going away. It's so freaking important that we get that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and look, sometimes things do get to be released, right? Golgi tendon right. organs locked down, triggers available, even atrophy sometimes gets to have a little release before it can come back to play. Like totally, sometimes things do get to be released and it's not the end of the line. So as a manual practitioner, which is, you mentioned what we worked on together as a manual practitioner, if my role is to release then great. Was there something there to release? Of course. Like we found some lesions. Yeah. Like got it. Cool. And if that doesn't resolve the pain, more release is not necessarily the answer. you got to bring the body back to movement because the body is designed to move. The body is not designed to be a couch potato. The body is not to, designed to be in perpetual Shavasana. The body is designed to move. And then we navigate that movement and any discrepancy in the movement so that we can be in Shavasana or in meditation without discomfort for sure, or asleep without being awakened by pain for sure. But the body's designed to move. So we've got to find out what the movement is. Mm -hmm. And I will also say that if we're not in alignment, were you going to say something, Lori? No, if we're not in alignment, adding strength can be detrimental. So it's kind of like we have two catch 22s going on at the same time. And sometimes that can really freak practitioners out. And the idea is just to know which one is which and to know the order of them. And the way to do that is through knowing anatomy, through deeply knowing anatomy. I want to hear what you have to say, Lori. And before we go on, because we did start mid conversation, I want to welcome everybody to the conversation. Joanne Barrett's in the house. Oh, hey, yay. I want to welcome everybody to the conversation. I love seeing all of you, each of you every week. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, big, huge, warm welcome to you. We meet every Tuesday at noon Eastern to talk practitioner stuff, body stuff. We're anatomy geeks that unite every Tuesday. I'm Gina Schatz hosting. I'm the developer of the Schatz method, which is a clinically developed trademark method that we use in my mastery group. Uh, to work clinically to alleviate pain at the source. And it's good for both manual and movement practices to add this method to what you're working with. So we're talking today with Lori about your work with the method and with your own body and adding strength and when to add strength. And you were gonna say something else, Lori, what's, what's the next thought? Um, my next thought was like this, even though like I know all of that in my body and you said that we get to move, right? Like our bodies are designed to move. Well. Like there's this little fear, like, but what if I do something? What if I hurt it? I think I should stay, you know, it's this, this kind of tug of war. Uh -huh. Um, uh -huh. even though I know that I know I get to move it, I, you know, uh -huh. but it, it's still, it was such a good reminder of when folks come to us in pain uh -huh. and pain been going on. And mine hasn't even been going on as long as some people's, but it's just such a, a good reminder that um, you, the fear around it, mm -hmm. it could be this, or it could be that, or it, you know, to, to uh, just hold space and be present for that. For sure. Yeah. Pain will definitely take you down a mental road quickly. Yeah. You know, it's like zero to 60. Yeah. Um, and your instincts to um, be thoughtful about the movement are real, right? Cause that's our formula alignment, strength, function. We've talked about this like forever alignment, strength, function. So the body's designed to move. Yes. And if the body's moving misaligned or, or out of alignment or with a distorted lever system, then that movement isn't safe. So how do you know Be through training and through working with a 
practitioner who knows, right? That's why we are practitioners so that we can be that for somebody else. And in our own bodies, I'm a, I'm a prime example of this. I have sensations, but I don't have any way to diagnose myself, you know, and I don't mean diagnose because we don't diagnose in our lane, but we diagnose function and patterns. My pain does not necessarily match my knowing about what to do with misalignment and function. In my own body, my pain does not lead me to my own treatment plan. It's not like I can get away with not seeing a practitioner just because I made a method that I know works. I still need that method gifted to me through a skilled practitioner. We all do. We're interdependent in that way. So when our clients come to us with pain sensation, yes, that's valid information and it's not the only information. We've got to be able to strategically think through what they're saying, what we're seeing, and how we know the body's designed. And all three of those bodies of information need to be part of our treatment plan with them, not just their pain sensation. We'll end up chasing a red herring. It's not where it is. I've done it myself to my own body. Like, oh, why didn't that work? Why didn't that thing that I know works work on me? Because I was addressing the wrong thing. I was following my pain sensation instead of the alignment. Yeah. So your, your instinct on that, Lori, is good. Like, and, and our clients are going to be nervous too about, should I move? And the answer is when you're positive about the way the body's designed as a practitioner and you're positive about optimal function, then you'll know whether the answer is yes, you should move. But if you're not positive about the anatomy and the function of that anatomy, then you don't know any more than your client knows if they should move. And then you'll be in resistance with them. Because they'll be guarding their own pain and their instincts to be careful. And if you don't have authority in that setting with them, like, look, I know it's dis- I know it's uncomfortable. Your structure is pristine right now. Literally, your joint is designed to move this way. I know there'll be discomfort moving it the first few times. And then it'll be like a hinge that got greased and you'll be okay. Unless you know that for sure, you could be leading them towards movement that's detrimental. So we get to know our anatomy. That's why we're here every week talking about it. We get to know our anatomy so that we can actually guide someone through that. And for manual practitioners, which I am primarily as well, we get to know movement too, right? So I know movement and I know alignment and I know anatomy. And when I'm working with someone, I don't necessarily spend an hour with them moving. And I'm definitely not doing strength training when I am doing moving. I do some movement because I'm repatterning the way they move, but I'm not doing an hour of movement, right? Like, for example, I had a client last week who um, fell skiing. It's classic, right? She fell skiing, hip pain, back pain. Cool. We took care of it first session. And something about her wanted to come back again. Great. I love that. What, what's up? What's on the agenda for today? What's your goal for us? What do you want to cover? Well, I feel like I love my yoga and I just sense that like, I'm never in pain after yoga, but I just feel like, I don't know, something's not quite right with my yoga. That's like a, that's like a dream to hear that for me because I'm not going to walk her through an hour long yoga practice and I'm not going to do strength training with her, but I did take her through what a yoga teacher would call two and a half poses. And all we worked on was the alignment and function in those poses that she could then like a book stamp, take to all the other poses and then go to a movement person and work on that movement with that alignment and that function. So whether you're, even if you're here, you're listening and you're a manual practitioner and you're like, well, why are they talking movement? Like that doesn't apply. Oh yes, it does. Oh, it certainly does. We get to know functional anatomy so that we can guide our clients into how to move safely so that they can go back and develop strength. Like you're saying, Lori, the strength was the missing piece for you, not a massage therapist's magic hands. The last step is strength training. That's always the last step in everybody and definitely in hypermobile constitutions, just like me, for sure. Oh my gosh, I could talk about this forever. I feel like we're weaving like all of our principles into one conversation here in this like beautiful way. I want everybody to like be here in the conversation with us, for sure. So Lori, how many um, sessions do you, how many, well, that's sort of like not the question. Um, How much strength do you think is required for you to heal your injury based on your experience with your body? Uh, Right. right. 
so I think what what moved I I felt it what moved it along more quickly um was strengthening it three days a week right repetition. I was what's that repetition repetition and though being more in, being in alignment making sure I was is is um, most optimally aligned before I added strength yes as, as I could be yeah because absolutely like I, I I don't feel like I could have had one without the other mm -mm. you definitely can't yeah and I've shared the story publicly before I will continue to share it for nine months, I was strength training three days a week out of alignment. Never worked. I was strength training, but I wasn't out of pain and I wasn't really getting strong. I was getting a little bit stronger, but like not for the effort I was putting in. Then I was aligned. We, and we, again, for those of us who are new to our conversation, external alignment, like where you put your body in space and internal alignment, which is what we do in the method are both needed. So my internal alignment got addressed. My bony structures got put into a safer ar arrangement with each other. And then the strength training was like, phew, right? So for those of you who are, you know, doing Pilates or personal training or any type of strength development, or if you know that your client needs strength, just sending them to the gym is not the answer. They have to have that internal structural alignment to be able to access the lever system to then strengthen their muscles. And so, I was strengthening three days a week out of alignment and it wasn't helping. So I love that you added that, Lorraine, like strengthening in alignment was the thing. Having your internal structure aligned. Go ahead. And it's interesting that it wasn't, we didn't spend the whole hour on my shoulder at all. We spent probably 10 minutes on strengthening my shoulder, but we spent 45 minutes strengthening my um the muscles that support my sacrum, right? My hips and my sacrum, my glutes, my, um, let's see, my abductors. Like we spent the bulk of the time with that. And then at the, it, like, probably, like I said, 10 minutes was strengthening shoulder. Mm -hmm. And so, and so my core, yeah. Yeah, so I know why, and you know why. So tell everybody, why is that important? Oh, the sacred sacrum. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Why, why to get rid of shoulder dis distress and mm -hmm. to strengthen the muscles around the shoulder? Why was that? Why was it needed that you strengthen around the sacrum as well? Because if my sacrum is off, everything above it is off and everything below it's off. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I had this little, um, it wasn't a torque, just a little curve in my back that was also you know, my sacrum was off and then, and then it pulled this little curve into my upper back. And then, it, you know, so no matter how much strength training I did with this, it wasn't going to matter if everything below it was off. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Sacrum centric and the axial skeleton before the appears that the axial skeleton be a support, a base. And if that's, if that's new information, axial and appendicular skeleton, we talk about that in a few different places, inspired beyond anatomy, definitely in level one. We talk about it again in level two, applied functional anatomy, because it's sort of the foundation, if you will, the bony land, the bony structures as a foundation of where muscles attach, the axial skeleton being different and distinctively different from the appendicular skeleton and the sacrum being where they meet. So that is, again, the, the piece of we get to know functional anatomy so that we can address function and, and eradicate pain. That's a big piece of it. So, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm glowing with pride because Lori and Danielle are both mastery of student mastery uh, practitioners. And so you guys knew that. And so you're, you're actually utilizing the method and, and gaining results. And it's just, I'm beaming. <laughs> I'm just beaming with pride. It's so exciting. Um, so what do you, go ahead, Lori. No, but also to your point is that, I, again, I keep going back to this pain thing, even though I know it, I, I knew all of that, I got so clouded by 
by discomfort, by pain that, you know, I needed somebody else. Like, like you said, Gina, even though we know this, we're very, I mean, I don't think there's anybody here that isn't very intimately aware of our bodies. And, you know, that sometimes that's a blessing and a curse, right? Yeah. I don't actually think it's a curse to get cloudy I mean, and to be in our own pain, right? but I hear what you're saying. What yeah. I, what I like to do with that awareness is that's what our clients are experiencing. So mm -hmm. when we just put back our practitioner hat on instead of the, we're the client hat when we get to be both, but when we put the practitioner hat back on, one of the ways that practitioners take themselves out of the game of success is they let the client's experience be the dominant experience in the room. And that doesn't work because pain and the confusion that comes with pain and the referral patterns that are connected to pain for sure. And knowing that they're spinning and positive about where the pain is and positive about, you know, what worked and what didn't work, just like I've been positive about what I thought was right. And, it, and you're saying the same thing with you, it, nod with compassion and know that there's more to the story than what they're sharing with you. And if you're not clear yet on how to, how to create awareness about what's more to the story, then as a practitioner, you get to go back for more training. Because their experience is not going to give you the answer. It's part of the solution. It's not the answer though. So just like you, just like me, I was positive. This is where I'm feeling it. I know anatomy. I know, I know, I know the alignment. I know the measurements. And I needed another practitioner to actually be like, well, but your body's saying this, right? Um, oh, thanks, Lori. Uh, yeah, we do. I did. I Thanks for the reminder. I forgot that we did talk about that in the, in the masterclass, which is, yes, it's free for everybody to, you know, if this is, if this conversation is like, Hmm, I think I need to know this dive in, let us, let us support you in this. Um, we get to be compassionate to our, uh, clients flight. And we talk so much about messaging in the mastery program because we get to explain to our clients in a compassionate, clear, knowledgeable way that yes, what they're experiencing is real and you know, whatever the body, whatever the body needs, the body is the third entity in the room. It gets to communicate with you. And we talk a lot about that in mastery. And I don't really, I haven't really heard other places talk about that. The body's got a whole wealth of information. A lot of times practitioners get themselves twisted up in a knot because they think they're supposed to have all the answers or they default to having the client's pain symptom be the driver, like we've already said. And that's only two of you. There's actually three of you in the room all at all times. So we get to train ourselves to know the body and to know how to interpret what the body is saying. And that that's really key. And it takes a whole lot of pressure off, right? Like your knowledge and know-how is absolutely needed. It's 33% of the equation. The, pain, the client's symptoms and pain and history and preferences, 33% of the equation, not 90% of the equation, where then you spend the next 10% trying to make the client happy. That's not what we're here for if you're working on pain. And then the body has 33% of the conversation. How much of us actually really take that much input from the body and not just from what we think about the body? That's not the same. It's three of you three of you. So it, it gets to be like easy for everybody. It gets to be easy for the client. It gets to be easy for the practitioner. It gets to be easy for the body to speak up and be understood and then address. And then we get to the source of the problem. And, and truthfully, I mean, I've said this a few times and I've gotten feedback that I, I understand why it would not land well, but I think that eradicating pain is so simple. I don't know why we're not all doing it. And the feedback that I've gotten before when I've said that is like, Gina, so arrogant. Blah, blah. And I get it why that could sound like I'm being arrogant. I guess, and I don't mean to be, that it's really not coming from a place of arrogance. I guess where I'm coming from is we spin out and spend a lot of like busyness being confident, arrogant, not confident, nervous, avoiding pain, uh, worrying about pain as practitioner. Like we spend a lot of energy spinning out and it's really meant to be so much easier than that. Does it require like mental gymnastics with every single client? Yes. And if you're up for that, cool, then great, go for it. Not every practitioner really likes that. Uh, um, Danielle, who you, you mentioned, Laurie, we, we were just talking about that the other day, that 
you know, movement practitioners like yogis and Pilates, and even personal trainers who uh, predetermine their movement for their clients, nothing wrong with that, by the way, huge fan. However, if you're navigating pain with folks, you can't really imprint on top of their body's needs a predetermined plan of attack. And attack's not the right word, but you know, a predetermined plan of movement. Because that means that you're just basically muzzling the body and telling it not to talk. It's you and your movement and the client and their ability, and that's it, except for the body gets to weigh in. But if you listen to what the body has to say, it's you're like on the hot seat every time. Every time a client walks in, you have no freaking idea how to prepare how to prepare for that, except you do. You prepare for it by getting really knowledgeable about anatomy and functional anatomy and get really knowledgeable about that and get really knowledgeable about that and practice your ass off so that you know what works and you know what doesn't work. And when you add those two things, a ton of knowledge and a ton of practice, then every client that comes in, it's kind of easy. I mean, you wish for them not to be in pain and you're not arrogant about your abilities, but as long as you're allowing yourself to like think through the problem and like really listen to what the body has to say and what you know about what that means, then you can create a treatment plan and then listen to the body's response on that, you know, and not be so like freaked out about, oh, did it work? Did it not work? Did they like it? Did they not like it? I mean, you want to be thoughtful about what your client's experience is, but that's not the focus of where your brain should be when you're problem solving the solution for the genesis of pain. Your, main, your mind space gets to be on the strategic thinking about what is functionally happening or not happening and how do I get it to happen if it's not. That's where your, your brain space gets to be. And for those of us who are like, you know, used to pre-planning a class and just go in and do your thing. Or I, I know for me, I did massage for so long that it was rote. <laughs> like I remember a couple of times catching myself. And for those of you who do full body massage, you know what I mean? You know, you go into like a Zen space. It's actually really meditative and lovely. It's a great way to spend the day. Hey, Rhonda. Um, and there would be times kind of like when you're driving your car and you're like, oh my God, how did I get to the exit? I don't even remember getting out the exit, right? There'd be times like that during the massage where I'd be like, did I do both legs? Like, I could like check to see if there's oil on it, you know? And so the point is like, if that's the type of work environment that you really enjoy, awesome. Like, I think everybody should have a massage like that where their practitioner is so like, not even in mental energy where they're just like a channel Everybody should experience that hopefully every day. Same thing with a nice flow yoga class where you're not questioning your body and, you know, deliberating over your abilities. Just be, just be like, there's such therapeutic benefit to that. And that's not the space to be in if you're troubleshooting pain. It's just not, you've got to have your thinking cap on. You've got to be in strategic thinking with every client. There's no way to pre-plan for that. There's no checkbox of to-dos when someone comes with pain. You got to be thinking. And if you like that, I like that. I like to have my mind active. I like to be like thoroughly immersed in what's happening. I like to be deeply connected with the process. So it's so for me, it feels easy. And that's what I mean when I say that. Awesome. All right. What else is going on? What's what's going on with you, Joanne? It's so good to see you. You're in a studio, it looks like. Are you teaching today? Okay. And so funny to see you here, Joanne, because I just read your love letter. Joanne sent me a beautiful love letter in the mail, and I just read it yesterday, and I was like, I got to reach out to Joanne, and poof, I manifested you. Here you are. Oh, good. Great. I am in a studio. I um, come on Tuesdays, but I am decided to check in with the group <laughs> before I start moving and doing things. Yeah. Nice. So can you hear me? Okay. With the AirPods. Perfect. Perfect. Um, yeah. I came back from the retreat feeling pretty inspired and, you know, just went right into measuring people right away and, um, you know, uh, stepping over insecurities. Cause I did feel like I was, you know, reviewed and was on top of it. So, um, you know, just letting go of insecurities and got right into the measuring and 
I agree with what you're saying with the classes, because generally I come with a prepared class, especially to the studio. Um, but in the last couple times I've been, uh, you know, the same people are coming and I kind of am getting, I measure them each time. So I'm coming prepared to do some more, um, mostly optimal sitting, standing blocks um, and getting on the block under the sacrum because everybody is just, uh, you know, the sacrum is never in alignment. It just seems like it's just off for the entire world right now. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I do have one client who, I mean, I didn't even, I did measure her, but before even measuring her, I could just see that right hip was, you know, really out and short, you know, visually I could see all these things happening. Um, so she's, you know, not really willing to do any private work with me, um, which is, you know, always a challenge, but, uh, I just have been bringing in a few exercises to, you know, work with her and strengthen her just before the class, you know because I'm a martyr, <laughs> not forever, but yeah. So I'm doing that and, um, and just going back down to, you know, believing in um, alignment, strength and function and a basic class. And, you know, um, like I told you, the one woman that was coming, you know, doing all these very hard poses, she just, you know, stopped, stopped coming after I asked her to, you know, go to the back room and she wasn't doing Laura. She was Laura. She wasn't doing any of the thing I was, any of the poses I was bringing to the class. She was just doing her own thing. And um, I was really trying to help her with a lot of, um, you know, strengthening moments and poses, but she didn't want anything to do with it. So um, that challenge has disappeared from my life. <laughs> Awesome. So Joanne, this client that you, or the student that you said comes early and you work with her early, she's willing to work with you privately that way, but not privately outside of. Well, I'm the one who comes early. I mean, I know that uh, instead of just, you know, walking in five minutes before the class, I'm coming say just 10 minutes and she's there sort of stretching things out, um, you know, cause she's forever in pigeon pose thinking that's going to help her right hip relax. Um, okay. So, yeah. So I basically come in and get her, I, I've been doing 60, 40 and getting her to stand with optimal, just standing with the correct alignment because she's uh, you know, pushes forward in her rib cage and she, her axis is way forward and she's sinking in her lower back. Mm -hmm. So what's your, um, what's your, guess about what's causing her hip, just her hip sensation that she pigeons to get rid of. Yeah. Right now, my guess is that, um, piriformis is super overworked and tight and, and QL, but not, not so as I did the, I did the, uh, so as release with her and it was like, just like jello. I mean, not tense or contracted at all. So if the back of the body the, um, or, or one of the deep sixes, but I thought it was piriformis and, um, and, and QL. And I'm only basing that on, well, in the measurements, but also just touching her body feels a little bit, I, I kind of described it like a trampoline sort of feels, um, like doesn't have any give. It just kind of spongy. If that mm -hmm. makes sense. Yeah. So, and, and so she did have, um, innominate and sacral measurements. You, you found measurements when you measured her? Yeah, I found um, right anterior and um, uh, uh, upslip left. So the, I think I'm saying that correctly. So her, um, her left side of the sacrum was tipping down and the right was higher. So that's a tilt. Was that an upslip or a tilt? Tilt, I'm sorry, tilt. Okay. Yes, tilt. So, um, and so what do you think she needs then? You said optimal standing is what you gave her. Yeah, and when we did, um, we did block under the sacrum with the knees bent on her back, and she said that that actually feels really good. That helps her, um, but it didn't take care of the it didn't take care of the problem. No, right, because that's not. So we don't want to we don't want to go chew down a functional assist path here because I know that our guests don't actually know our assists or our measurements. Um, 
but I want to invite you, Joanne, to think about what would be the probable cause for the measurements that you found and how can you get targeted for her? Mm -hmm. But actually, before I, before I give you that suggestion, what's your intention for her? I would love for her not to be in pain. She's yeah. in pain. Does she know that? Yes. Okay. So we get to always communicate our intention to our clients, right? We get to always communicate that. Otherwise, if you're like me and you see a problem and you go to solution, it could sound like you're just railroading over someone's preferences. I have to really be thoughtful about that because as soon as I see something in the body, I'm like, oh, here's your, here's, here's your solution. Somebody might not want that in that moment. And they might think that I'm not paying attention or judging them or what have you. So just be really thoughtful. All of us get to be really thoughtful about, are we communicating our vision and our intention clearly before we give advice? So it's not implied just because someone comes to you as a practitioner that they want you to tinker with them. They might want to be, especially in a, in a group movement experience, Sometimes I, you know, I've gone to a group, I know we all have, I've gone to a group training where I just wanted to like do my own thing. Not like your girl who was doing literally her own thing, but like, I don't want, I just want to be in a community right now. And I don't want to be messed with. I just want like, I want to be in like minds and just have my minute to me, right. Without having to answer to anybody or anything like that. So it's not implied in a group setting that they actually want your intervention. So we get to be really thoughtful to communicate your intention and then wait for permission before going at it, right? I would say that even those of us who work one-on-one, -on -one, it's not implied either, right? Like I, we, I, I say this in our training, I have a consent form that says you will give me permission to, to touch you, to put hands on. And when you come in, I still ask the first time I put my hands on you because just because you said so when you signed the consent form still means that I get to ask permission because you're a human and I, I'm not dominating in that, in that space, energetically or physically or any other way, right? So just be really, we all get to be really clear to communicate our intention. And it might be really welcomed and received in their heart and today still may be a no. Thank mm -hmm. you and no, right? So you get to ask for permission to, to interject. And when we do interject, when it's a client who's, um, as, you, as you said, you know, jo Joanne, that you, you know you could support her one-on-one -on -one and she's not there yet. When we interject, the best chance we have of supporting them fully is to interject with the biggest uh, paintbrush swipe on the canvas as possible. Hmm. The biggest one. So you, you do have measurements and you do have patterns and functional assist and you're, you're loaded with an arsenal of tools. And my invitation for you then is based on probable cause, what's the number one thing that would mostly move the needle? And, and keep in mind that when we know what would move the needle, it might also upset the apple cart. Mm -hmm. And that's okay because that's the... That's the client, student, patient's first feedback that their body has something to say too about what's happening, not just something to say that, that the body's upset, right? We get to really be thoughtful that our clients still sometimes think when they're in pain, we do too, when they're in pain that somehow their body is an adversary instead of an ally, right? The body is communicating pain on purpose so that we don't blow a knee so that we don't dislocate our shoulder. Like it's actually a, a friendly gesture for when the body screams out in pain, it's actually trying to communicate collaboratively. And sometimes we're like, ah, oh, that hip, I'm just gonna stretch it and make it stop hurting. You know, and that's mm -hmm. like the, that's like not quite the, the, the response that we would wanna give an ally. So when we offer someone the biggest swipe of the paintbrush, that may either move the needle or disrupt the apple cart. That's their, that's their in initiation into, oh, the body had something to say. Huh, I didn't even hear that coming. I just thought I heard this other thing that the body was saying. There's actually more here. And then that there's an opening there for you as her clinician to say, I can bridge the gap for you. 
right? That's, it's not what we do in yoga or whatever it is that you're doing yoga, Pilates, wherever you're, you're serving your clients most, there's this other place that I can do this other thing for you. And so that, that would be my recommendation for her. Otherwise, Joanne, you guys are drip feeding each other. Mm -hmm. You're coming in 10 minutes early. She's not getting a whole lot of benefit. You're not getting paid anything extra. And your intention for her is not really being reached. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. So back to, back to marketing. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Well, Lori. Hey, Gina, when you were saying like approach it with a broad, broad paintbrush, does that mean not like, what are you saying? Like not giving her a hundred little, oh, it could be this or that, or that, that is it just like, so it's drilling down to the one thing that, like you said, can move the needle, Mm -hmm. right? Getting real. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the, and the answer where we get that is probable cause. So, and I, and I know for those of you who are guests today, we're doing a little bit of method speak. And so bear with us. Um, but it's true, whatever, whatever method or technique you're using, what we want to avoid is giving clients 25 tiny little nuggets of possibility. Cause first here's why that's too many. They're, they're overwhelmed and they're probably dismissing you after five. And most importantly, it sounds like you're guessing. And as soon as you start guessing, they no longer see you as the authority, as the person who has the answer for them. Now your guessing has created a guessing in them instead of assurance and clarity, right? And that's what we want to give someone, especially when they're in pain. Because as you said, Lori, just like me, when you're in pain, your mind is racing, And sometimes into places that are like way into the future, like, you know, your chapter doesn't end like this, but we can go there when we're in pain. So we don't want to create guesswork and confusion when someone's in that state. And if you're working as a uh, practitioner, who's also working with the shots method, and you know that there's a messaging piece to convert over into a different style of work, you want to be clear about that with them so that they understand the distinction and the difference and why. Like, why would they bother? But even if you're not a shots method practitioner, you probably do more than one thing. Most of us who've been at this game for a while do more than one thing. Why, why would they switch? Why would they switch? You've got, and and that's a rhetorical question. You have, you get to have that answer clearly spoken in your messaging and ready, ready to deliver. Why would they switch? Because boom, and, it, and that answer to that question is always benefits driven, not about you and your training and your awesomeness. Come to me. I'll tell you how awesome you are. Clients need to hear what the benefit is for them. Why would they bother? Otherwise, it looks like you're just trying to get them to waste more time and spend more money because they don't really get it. Like why? You get to bridge that, that clarity gap for them and then deliver. Did that answer your question, Lori? I feel like I answered a couple more than you asked. Okay, good. I'll make sure I covered it. (laughs) Okay, great. Okay, this is exciting. You guys are up to big stuff. Mm -hmm. Rhonda, what's happening with you this week? It's nice to see you back again. Kind of running today's Tuesday training like we do uh, in alumni meetings. Look what's going on with you. What's going on with you? What's going on with you? Laura, I see you here in the background too. It's nice to have you here. Welcome. And Rhonda's gone. <laughs> She's like, no, I don't want to talk. No, I, I that, that's not true. She probably had a call coming in. All right. Oh, who else just got here? Oh, yep. I thought so. She just came back in again. She must've disconnected. <laughs> that's funny. Mercury is retrograde. So it's amazing that any of us is here. And if this is even streaming, a bigger miracle. <laughs> got to find our sense of humor. All right, loves. Are there any, there she is. She came in on Lori's link again. That's all right, Rhonda. I totally get it. Unmute yourself though. So I can hear you. You figured it out. You got right back in super quick. There you go. There we go. Sorry. Yeah. I just <laughs> got lost. Oh, I'm not good. Lori. <laughs> we know you're Rhonda. We got you. <laughs> Hi, Lori. Um, Let's see. Uh, it's it's been a crazy week, um, kind of more crazy weeks um, to come. 
had a nice chat with Lori. I don't know if she spoke with you about it, but we had a lovely chat. Good. <laughs> um, I quickly looked over the four principal handout. Mm -hmm. I don't have it with me right the second. Yeah. Um, it seemed to make sense. <laughs> Good. Um, and, you know, I'm slowly putting my toe in the water here, but um, I probably won't get too deep until the fall because there's just so much going on in my home. So um, Got it. I'm just, you know, peeking in here and there when I can. Got it. Well, we love having you here and we will still be here in the fall. So there's no worries about that. Thanks, Lori, for putting Thank the... Thank goodness. Yeah, right? Yeah, it's all right. Thanks for putting the link in the chat, Lori. That's awesome. Yeah, we have a, a downloadable guide. I like that downloadable guide because, um, it, well, first of all, it was my first run through with graphics. So I was like, oh, I know I can actually make something look readable. That's great. And um, those anatomy principles, the first four, there's eight anatomy principles that I've identified. We've talked about this a, a time or two before. And the first four are outlined in that guide and, and then what to do, like how to, how to actually implement them. And I feel like it's the feedback I've gotten from practitioners is it has really helped them move the needle, whether they're manual or movement practitioners on understanding the applied functional anatomy, the functional anatomy and how to apply it. And so that makes me really happy. So I do love that guide. I'm glad you got that Rhonda. Awesome. Hey, Laura, how's it going? What's going on for you this week? I'm getting a new car today and getting ready to go on vacation so these are awesome yeah so it's a little busy week but it's all good stuff okay good are you going somewhere warm for vacation no we're just going to west virginia so but okay. it's supposed to be kind of rainy so we'll, we'll be we'll be dodging the rain with some hiking and stuff like that you know nothing like a good hike nothing, like a good, nothing like a good hike yeah for sure I was just looking, um, I saw something on Instagram that was kind of talking about, um, what you were saying before from a pelvic floor PT, I, I follow, cause you were talking about like a checklist or what have you, like, you can't just go through a checklist with everyone. And she, she was talking about how people go on like YouTube or they Google stuff about like how to fix their pelvic floor issues. And I love this. She says, you are not a monolith, <laughs> right? Like not all people with the exact same symptoms need the exact same, your diagnosis doesn't define your program. Amen. It was really, really good. I was like, she goes, this is why you want a diagnosis into an exercise search bar. Isn't going to get you very far. It's cookie cutter BS. <laughs> Preach. And I was like, yeah. So then she talked about how she had, you know, two clients with the same on paper, right. Had sent similar things happening in, even in terms of lifestyle, but then how she noticed like different, like they had the same diagnosis on paper, right? They both had um, pelvic organ prolapse, but then like she was doing slightly different things with them because one had difficulty allowing her diaphragm and deep abs to come into their routine without her pelvic floor taking over or bearing down. And the other one um, also had her nervous system picking up movement patterns and coordination pretty quickly without compensating. So like Again, you can have two people with a lot of the similar diagnoses, but have to treat them totally differently depending on a lot of other factors. So I just thought that was, I literally just saw it as you were talking and I was like, oh my God, <laughs> it's a sign. <laughs> it's totally great. Yes. Thank you for bringing that up. It's so true, right? Yeah. It's so true. I remember, yeah, I've, I've shared this story before where I've had uh, a particular practitioner in mind who was just like, you're making it too hard. You're making it too hard. There's got to be a matrix. And I'm like, <laughs> there's not that like takes away the individuality of all of us, but there is a matrix per se about how the body's designed. Right. That's the same. We all have the same shoulder girdle. We all have the same muscles. And yes, there's a, I get it. Like there's a couple people have, you know, so as minor and blah, blah, blah. Like I get the, 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 very low percentile nuances, body to body. I get that. Largely speaking, 99.9% .9 of us musculoskeletally are the same. That is the matrix to work with. How is it designed? Do you freaking know that? Do you know it inside and out? And do you know then how to restore it back? 
And that's where your ex, that's where your advanced training comes in. That that whatever you're working on, whatever your tool set is, whatever your skill set is, whatever your methodology is, should get you back to how it's designed. And if you get somebody back to how they're designed, there will be no pain. So that's really where the matrix is. The design of the body is the matrix, not not the diagnosis is not the is not the matrix. And I would even take it one step further. As you guys have heard me say this before. Uh, as a massage therapist, which was my first license, we were not allowed to diagnose insofar as what we could treat, which means musculoskeletal, I can say this is a Golgi tendon organ thing, but I can't say you have scoliosis, but I could recognize that paraspinals on one side are doing something different than the other. And at first, because uh, I was young and, and defiant, I was like, well, why can't I say, why, why am I not? I have a medical license. Why can't I just diagnose? Ugh. And what I realized now looking back was that was one of the best gifts I got early on in my career, because the idea that I couldn't diagnose legally led me to messaging effectively. It also led me to listening better. And mostly it led me to results because here's the thing, even if you can diagnose, even if your client does come with a diagnosis, even if they're positive about the diagnosis, as you're saying in the IG thread, Laura, the question still should be, how did that get there? How, how did they get to a place of getting that diagnosis, which is a functional process, by the way? And more importantly, how are you going to get them out of that mess? The diagnosis has so little meaning. It gives you a direction to look at, but it doesn't tell you how it got there and it doesn't tell you how to get them out of the mess. And that is where our real skill comes in. So even if there were a matrix on diagnoses, it wouldn't actually help. <laughs> but we get to know the anatomy. We get to know it. We get to know it like the back of our hand. We get to recite it. We get to know it and know it and know it. And we get to have skill around how to address it. And if that was the only thing that we got from today, that would be beautiful. That would be beautiful. Awesome. Thanks for bringing that, Laura. I love a good feisty IG post. <laughs> I do love it. Okay, my lovelies. Any other questions for today? Can I support you in anything else before we wrap up today? Anybody? Nothing? You feel good? Feel full? Okay, great. Excellent. So um, a week early, I just want to give you guys a little heads up. We are having our next annual summit coming up June 6th, 7th, and 8th. It's my favorite. It's a big undertaking. We have a whole panel of speakers. It's live. It's three days straight. Um, we uh, do have the registration page as of today, officially ready to go. And I'll start dropping it into our comments and links, you know, link sharing uh, first of May. So if you guys want to mark your calendars in the meantime, it's 11, it's 11 to 2.30. And I'm hesitating. Is it 11 or is it 11.30? I think it's 11 to 2.30 <laughs> Eastern. Again, it's live. Of course, I don't anticipate that anyone will have all of that time uh, free and open. I get to mark my calendar, obviously, because I'm the host. But come for what you can. Stay for as long as you can. Um, the replays are always available for a very short period of time, but you'll get a chance to get caught up. Um, awesome, Lori. Thank you. It is 11. Okay, great. 11 to 2.30. Um, oh, you don't know. You're just copying what I said. <laughs> I just was listening to what you said. So either 11 or 11.30. Yeah. It's, again, it's it's in there. Just mark your calendar so that yeah, you have save time. The day. Save the day. <laughs> yeah, and mark it. And if you're already working that time, which is great, I definitely want you guys to be out there serving in the world. At least you'll have it marked so that you know to come back later that day and, and catch the replay. Um, and again, we'll send out the registration links next week. Um, yes, there'll be a, a, all kinds of good goodies that go with it, and, and I'll share all those details, but I want to make sure, because we're all so busy, that we have at least marked. And please, uh, not only uh, invite all of your colleagues to the summit, let all of your peers know, because it's free. Everybody gets to be served, like full cups, ready to go for the rest of the year. Um, please invite them and share the dates with them. Um, and also, uh, if you think that someone could benefit from today's conversation, I really appreciate you sharing the link to today's replay as well. All right, my loves. Okay, babes. It's so great to, to talk shop with you. It's one of my favorite hours of the week. Have a really great week. Do amazing work in the world and I'll see you.